so it has the following theorem. My numbering system is a little out of control. What should this be? What's this last number you have? 312. Okay, so 313. <coughs> and so this is something called Picard's theorem. <laughs> A different one. <laughs> sense that the absolute value f of x y1 minus f of x y2 is less than or equal to k absolute value of y1 minus y2 for some k and for all x in the first interval negative a a and y1 y2 in the second interval, negative bb. Then the equation y prime is equal to this function of x and y with initial condition that y of 0 should be 0.
So a solution will be y as a function of x. And that will be a solution to the differential equation as long as we restrict x to some interval around zero. <coughs> y of 0 is equal to 0. So we want to solve that as a function of x. And we restrict to cosine x, y is defined everywhere. But in order to apply the theorem, you have to restrict to some uh, region. So we can restrict to negative 1, 1 plus negative 1, 1. Now, to show that this is Lipschitz, use the mean value theorem on cosine x. So absolute value of cosine x, y1 minus cosine x, y2. Regard x as fixed. <coughs> Divided by the absolute value of y1 minus y2 is equal to, when I differentiate this as a function of y, I will get x sine of x times some constant c, which will be less than or equal to the absolute value of x. And if I'm restricting x to be in the interval negative 1, 1, this will be less than or equal to 1. And so my function cosine xy is Lipschitz. on y with constant y. Notice <clears throat> that that calculation uh, required me to restrict x in some way. This would not work for arbitrary x on a real line because this would go to infinity. So I couldn't get a decent estimate. So this would be an example to which the theorem would apply. And it would say, that yes, we can get a solution to this differential equation. And indeed, it will be unique. Did I write unique in this statement? Yes. yes. So the theorem would apply here. When you have <clears throat> something like cosine of xy, it would be a hopeless task to try to separate out the x's and y's. And so you would never be able to maneuver this around to the point where you could apply the theorems from undergraduate differential equations to this. It, it wouldn't separate out or anything. So uh, you would not be able to uh, explicitly write down a solution. Nevertheless, one likes to know that the solutions exist. So we're going to do it with the 
situation where it can be applied. So we need a complete metric space and we need some function t to which we're going to apply it. Now, <clears throat> when you're solving differential equations, the first impulse is to integrate them. So, if we integrate, <clears throat> solve the following. Integrating y prime, you get y, and that will be the integral from 0 to x, and now we need another letter for the integration will be the integral from 0 to x, f of t, y of t dt. So in this form, if you think about it, on the right-hand side, we can use this to plug in any function we like for y do the integration, and out will come a new function of x. And what we're really looking for here is a function that when you plug it in and do the integration, produces the same function again. So well, that's just a fixed point. So functions p of x, let us define t v at x to be the integral 0 to x f of t v of t dt. So we just plug something in on the right hand side do the integration, and out comes a new function. So the solution, y prime is equal to f of x, y, is a fixed point This is the idea. You convert from a differential equation to what's called an integral equation, namely an equation that has an integral sign in it. And then we've reformulated the problem so that we are now looking for a fixed point where we define t by this formula here. Now that's in general terms. So we will work with continuous functions on some interval. some restrictions on 
beta. Now our function f is continuous on a compact set, so it's bounded. So let's see. Assuming that we've plugged in a function where this makes sense, we can estimate the infinity norm of T phi this is equal to or less than or equal to the soup over x in negative a a. When I integrate, I can bring the absolute value inside, and that will be the integral 0 to x of the infinity norm of f <coughs> And the biggest that can be this is at most C times A. <coughs> so whatever function you stick into here, resulting function has norm at most c times a. Now, what other requirement could we have? Well, if we're going to plug a function into here, since this is only defined on minus bb in the second variable, the values of this function have to lie between minus b and b. So, in order for f t, v of t to make sense, the 
interval beta beta, so this should be C beta. Okay, so in order to be able to plug a function in, take the output and plug it back in again, which is what you'd have to do for the contraction mapping principle, we must have that C beta is below B. So, <coughs> the first requirement is that C beta should be less than or equal to B. Where did you get the function in the x variable was only defined on minus a a. So we really can't expect a solution beyond that. It wouldn't make any sense. Second requirement is that beta should be less than or equal to a since f of x y is only defined is in the interval minus a, a. Now, to get the third requirement, okay, so at this point, so our metric space we have to look at T phi minus T psi and what we will get is the integral from 0 to x 
psi of t dt. And so the absolute value of the left-hand side where we use the fact that f is Lipschitz in the second variable. So this is at most the integral 0 to x of k times the absolute value p of t minus psi of t dt. <coughs> How big can that be? Well, the infinity norm difference between phi and psi times k times the interval width, which is beta. So this is less than or equal to beta times k times the infinity norm of phi minus psi. So that's true for all x, and therefore, the infinity norm <coughs> of t phi minus t psi So this gives the third restriction on the number beta. principle 
gives a unique fixed point. So the interval on which you can expect a solution is governed by, first of all, how large the function f is. The larger it is, the smaller beta, because we're dividing by c here, which is the infinity norm. And it's also governed by the Lipschitz constant. The larger that is, the smaller the interval on which we can get this to work. And so that's uh, the proof of the theorem, and of course I could have stated it with the value of beta up front, but I just wanted to see, uh, show you how these theorems evolve. So you go along and you say, okay, I'd like to apply this. What do I need in order to be able to apply it? Okay, I need this constraint. Then you go on a bit further and you find you need another constraint, and a further still you need a third constraint, but that's it. Once you have those, and so the value of beta comes out naturally when you look for what is required in order to apply the contraction mapping theorem. Turn for the moment to y prime is equal to cosine xy <coughs> on minus one one cross minus one one. So what do we get here? Well a solution <coughs> on the interval negative beta beta where beta is less than the minimum put in the numbers, B is 1, C is 1, A is 1, and 1 over K is 1. So for any value of beta that's strictly less than 1, we are guaranteed a solution to that potential.
solutions but without uniqueness. The uniqueness was a product of the fact that the contraction mapping principle has for free a uniqueness of fixed point condition that goes along with it. So to illustrate this, solution is I constructed the equation from the solution. <coughs> On the other hand, solutions. These are globally defined functions. Cube root of x makes sense for all x. So not only did we get a solution, but we got multiple solutions. And the reason the theorem doesn't apply here is that the function f of x, y is badly behaved at the origin. And so Why does not satisfy the hypothesis? So it's possible to have differential equations with multiple solutions, and the reason that that can occur is that we don't have the hypotheses of the cards existing. Uh, different types of equations.